the Glaze Report conducted by Dr. Avis Glaze. That was released in January of 2019. So that brought along some major systemic changes. The two biggest, I guess, would be it was the dissolution of school boards, which was certainly a, a big item for our area in Nova Scotia. And it was also a report that saw school-based administrators and regional staff leave the Nova Scotia Teachers Union and subsequently um, formed the Public School Administrators Association of Nova Scotia, the acronym PSANS. So those were the two big changes and the school boards that impacted communities and families in different ways. And the idea of leaving the teachers union at the time was such a foreign topic that everybody kind of responded to it in a different way, but it didn't create a mass exodus by any means. There were comparables out there, for example, Ontario. So it's really turned into a new system for us. And, you know, right now I'd, I'd say it's, it's operating a high functioning uh, system. Earlier this week, I was out for dinner with three British Columbia superintendents and I asked them how much of their time was spent dealing with their school boards in, you know, in various ways. And to a person, they said upwards of 70% of their time, which I don't know why, I guess I should have maybe known this, but no one had ever <clears throat> explicitly said that. Wow, that's a lot of your time spent in supporting and working. And yes, the reality is if you are a superintendent, the board is your employee. That's who you work for. So I suppose it makes sense. In, in looking at what's happening in Nova Scotia, they have disbanded school boards, which I know has been topics of conversation throughout Canada and the U.S. in some cases, uh, but they did it. and. I was so curious to find out the impact of that and, and other changes that have happened. I'm somewhat familiar again with Nova Scotia, having done some work there, but not in the recent past. And so a lot of these changes, which have happened over the last four or five years, made me curious. And so I reached out to Jared Purdy. I didn't know Jared. Jared was gracious enough to accept my invitation to be on the show. And as you'll see, he's a uh, very personable positive, really thoughtful leader. We talk about a lot of different things, not just the school board issue, but that that was certainly something I was curious about. Jared represents my very first Nova Scotia guest on the show. And so we are knocking them off. We're getting all across Canada and continuing to show everyone just the high quality of great leaders we have in Canada. I know this is going to be a special twist, dif different kind of conversation today with the Regional Executive Director of the Tri-County Center for Education. I may have got some of those words right. It's a long title, but Jared is the person leading the charge in the southern portion of Nova Scotia. And I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Jared Purdy. So Jared, of all the, the Canadian leaders I've had on this show, I don't want to say for sure, but I feel like you're the only one that's still actively playing hockey. <laughs> That's a generous term, but accurate. Yes. <laughs> How often are you on the ice each week? Well, that's a, I can answer that in two ways. If you count coaching my daughter, I'm on twice a week. If you count playing, I don't know if I can answer it by week or let's say twice a month to be generous. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you have, you have, you're on one of these flexible things, but I know you mentioned you'd gone out to a tournament out in uh, Manitoba. Yeah. You thought it was, was it a teachers related tournament or, or not? So no, that so one no. was, that was our junior A franchise that we have here in Yarmouth, the Yarmouth Mariners. I'm a part owner, but at that time, up until this year, uh, I was also the assistant coach. So we were fortunate enough to, to win the Maritime Hockey League. And that's an automatic berth in the Centennial Cup, which is the national championship. So yeah, a few kids first time on the plane and we flew out to Portage La Prairie, Manitoba and my wife and kids joined me and it was a, it was an amazing experience, but, uh, Certainly made for less vacation in the summer that year. As a father of, of kids still in school and so forth, you're a busy guy. And now you have this relatively new role. And I plead a little bit of ignorance myself, who 
you know, kind of prides myself in knowing what's happening across Canada and education. I work with that, but I knew things were happening in Nova Scotia, but I wasn't quite as up to speed as I should have been or could have been. So just tell us a little bit about how has the structure of K-12 education changed in Nova Scotia over the past four or five years? You're right. The landscape has changed. You know, I think I'd start with the Glaze report conducted by Dr. Avis Glaze. That was released in January of 2019. So that brought along some, some major systemic changes. Two biggest, I guess, would be it was the dissolution of school boards, which was certainly a, a big item for our area in Nova Scotia. And it was also a report that saw school-based administrators and regional staff leave the Nova Scotia Teachers Union and subsequently um, formed the Public School Administrators Association of Nova Scotia, the acronym PSANS. So those were the two big changes. The school boards, you know, that, that impacted communities and families in different ways. And the idea of leaving the teachers union at the time was such a foreign topic that everybody kind of responded to it in a different way, but it didn't create a mass exodus by any means. There were comparables out there, for example, Ontario. So it's really turned into a new system for us. And, you know, right now I'd, I'd say it's, it's operating if, high functioning uh, system. And what would have been sort of the major reasons for the change? So in, in this report, what did it, why, why was this suggested as a necessary change? I think from, from the PSANS perspective, a lot of it had to do with school principals at that time were their supervision of staff. So you're supervising fellow union members. And in some ways you're building managers, you're in executive sure. leadership. So it was, it was making it a clear kind of delineating the lines between leadership and, and those you supervise. So that was the main landing piece for PSANS, which, which now it's a professional association. It's still, we still are very much related to the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, still supported by many things within the union, pension and benefits and all those pieces are still very much connected. And we have a great working relationship with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union as well. And, and the dissolution of school boards was, was kind of a different layer for me. I hadn't had much experience other than going as a principal or as a teacher. I think right now we're actually, and I, I think you and I'll chat about it maybe in a little bit, but in responding to parents in the province, we're actually going to, we're going to give birth to a few new tables provincially in every region that will address the point of entry issue that some families express uh, were lost in, in the dissolution of school boards. It's fascinating, especially when you talk about the, the shift from principals outside of the union. So here in Saskatchewan, principals have always been part of the union. And then when I started working on British Columbia, they had done something like this in the past, but several years ago. And you're just asking people about how that works. It's funny because once you are in a system, you don't know any other way. So when I ask people right. about being a principal as part of a union, they go, well, how else would you do it? It's fine. And they they don't seem to struggle. I'm not saying that there's never any conflict in that role, but again, you just know what you know. Out in British Columbia, they can't imagine that, right? And right. vice versa, right? You know the world you know. And you're in a bit of a unique situation in some respects in that you you don't have as a, as a and your official role now is regional. Uh, give me the, re, the official title here because I'll mess it up if I try it. Regional Executive Director. Region. I knew there was regional there's executive right. and direct. The right. Oh, anyway, for just for, for cleanliness, that's CEO, superintendent, director, whatever term you use in your province. But you didn't have an experience with school boards. You didn't have an experience leading a district where principals were part of a union. This is the world that you know as a new regional executive director. So in some ways that probably gives you advantage because like what else? What, so what I always wonder is for those folks, whether they're teachers, principals, parents, is there still kind of a, well, back in the good old days, or remember when we used to do that, or like you've kind of described as like, seems like people have moved on and they've accepted that this is, this is the new reality. So I always wonder about those sort of lingering yeah. pa past memories of, of how things used to be and how great it was back then, which is always a little bit skewed. Our, our memories are never quite as good as we, we might think they are. Yeah. I think for me, the, I kind of got it at two layers at the time that this change was, was taking place, I was on secondment to the province of Nova Scotia. And my role was the, I was the leader of the principal's forum standing committee. So 
we navigated a lot of that together. So I was able to, I guess, get a really good understanding to some of the changes that were happening. And I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, I had uh, access to 18 to 20 principals and vice principals from all across the province. So that really enabled me to really understand the, the, the dynamics of the changes, but also the depths of the changes and the passion across the province to those that were for it, those were that were against it, and maybe those that just weren't sure. So, but you are right. When this, this happened, I was still uh, technically a principal at the time. I think it was just the fear of the unknown. And, and like you said, everybody kind of, you know, this is, this is the way we've always done business. How could we go a different path? Speaking from our, our uh, regional center for education, I think it's gone really well. You know, I think the relationship, the, one of the big fears was this will damage the relationship between school-based administrators and, and teachers and, and other support staff. Um, that didn't happen here. The relationships remain strong. Uh, they remain strong today. And I'd argue a lot of people would say, I don't notice any drastic difference between the days of uh, being in the NSTU versus not. And I think a part of that too is, you know, I, I, I think the world of the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, you know, my wife's a member of the union and many of my good friends as well. And we have good working relationships with the NSTU. So for example, for us, we have, it's called the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. It's teacher management. So we meet with our union eight months out of the 10 of the school year and talk about everything, issues, things that are going well, areas for growth. And a lot of those, a lot of those pieces remain consistent. And I think being a part of the, of the pension plan, having those benefits, the NSTU negotiations still very much impact salary, those pieces. So the idea of it being drastically different, we found out that that wasn't the case. And we've continued to operate very much the same as, as we did prior to the change in all honesty. I mean, there's no doubt about it, that relationships are always the key to this. You, if you have challenges with that or people that aren't willing to concede or really just build that social capital, it doesn't matter really what the change is. It's yeah. going to be difficult and vice versa. And you got good people that understand. And, and that's the other thing about it. So as you've got teachers, you've got principals and you've got uh, district and provincial people at the end of the day, everybody is, should be aligned with the same purpose, right? We're trying to make this world better for our students, right? We're trying to create better student outcomes. Can you speak a little bit about, and again, I'm, I'm not asking you to compare then and now, but when you look at, at how this restructuring is intended to support student outcomes, what, what would you say about that? I think we've We've really hit our stride in the last number of years and it not even necessarily related to the change, but we, we ask ourselves two very important questions. How are the kids doing and how do we know? And I think those two guiding questions, you know, they lead into things like collaborative professionalism, collective efficacy, and, and those are the pieces that we, that we build ourselves on. So when I think of how are the kids doing, you know, just directly related to the change. The kids are still coming to school the same way they were in those days, you know, and our task is again, students and families, their well-being and student achievement. That, those are the things that, that we remain focused on. I think to your point, the relationships is where I really think we, we find ourselves above most. It's a very tight knit, uh, group that we have down here. Administrators work extremely well with principals. And when you think of the, the shift of you know, now, uh, now a principal is not a part of the union. Now they're, now they're my supervisor. They always were. It's just the yeah. structure has changed somewhat, but you know what? It's, it's still those people that still care for one another. And you mentioned alignment. That's, that's a theme for us. And, and I really feel alignment within the province of Nova Scotia has, has drastically improved in the last three years, you know, business plans and student success planning, capital planning. All of those pieces are very much aligned now. And I think consistency has been great too. You know, our focus on literacy, numeracy, student well-being, equity, every region's pushing in the same direction. So I think it goes back to when you think of how are the kids doing now, the kids are doing well. There, there's room for growth, obviously, but the change, in my opinion, made, made a difference for the good in terms of student achievement and outcomes, because I think it did create further alignment. Prior to the change we did, whether we want to see it this way or not, we had eight different entities and, and to some degree that's still true. Like if we're all vehicles, the, the engine looks different in our vehicle than it does for yeah. our partners in Cape Breton, 
But when we think of alignment and the direction for student achievement and well-being, ourselves and Cape Breton at both ends of the province are doing, doing the same things and we're meeting the same people. So I really think when you unpack it all, alignment and strategic alignment has been a big difference for us in the province. And we're starting to see the growth that we want to see. Certainly our provincial assessment results aren't where we want them to be currently, but we are trending upward and, and that's exciting. And I do think that's really due to alignment and, you know, networking and collaboration, which has, which has improved since that change. Well, one of the things that I, I pay very close attention to in my work in all of the provinces is how well or how poorly districts work or don't work together. And everyone's going to say they enjoy collaborating and there's not an animosity or even a perceived competition between districts, although that may be there in some respects. But at the same time, I know that, for example, in British Columbia, there's a really strong desire to be, to work as, as a bit of a collective. So, so back to your point around, I think what we're, what the aim is like, how are we, how are, and this is how we are as individuals, right? Like I want my own identity of who I am, but I also want to be part of something bigger too. Sure. And I want to really feel like I'm part of something bigger that I have people that are aligned in our thinking and that we can support one another. So I think that's what I hear you describing is that there's a, a more of a cohesion amongst the eight, the eight regions to say, yeah, we're, we have our own thing and we're our own uh, communities that have nuanced differences. But in, at the end, there's not, a, there's not a bunch of differences between, you know, a, a 12 year old kid where you are and a 12 year old kid in Cape Britain. They're all like, we, we have to help them in the same ways. But you had mentioned the disbandment of school boards, which is a pretty big shift. And you're the only, only province that has that. You mentioned a little bit about sort of what you're doing to, to remedy that. And maybe if there's any other kind of gaps that this new system created that we thought, oh, well, that is something different that we have to sort of adjust and tweak for. So I'm just wondering if you can kind of think about, because no change is perfect. It's not designed to, to solve every problem and it sometimes creates new, new problems or issues you hadn't thought of. So maybe just share a little bit about some of the thinking around how are you going to remedy any kind of perceived gaps? Sure. So I think first and foremost, I think back to our former deputy minister, Kathy Montroy, she really started us off on the path of, of networking. Who's the region that, that you compare to, whether it's size or, or data and go to your neighbor, talk about if school A is, is achieving high results and school B isn't it like in her world and the way she mentored us, it was school, school B should be talking to school A. And, and the difference now is that was always within your, your area, right? So within Tri-County, who's the school? She kind of got us out of that, that comfort zone of maybe school B for us is in Cape Breton. Maybe it's in Halifax, maybe it's in Chignecto. So I think that really opened up the, the alignment piece, but you're right. Feedback from our communities and, and families and, and parents. That point of entry, it's still not where we want it to be. And, and there are folks who that school board was that point of entry all along before the change. And since the change school advisory councils have been that point of entry for communities, really proud of uh, the school advisory councils we have here in Tri-County are they're high functioning. Um, they're well represented. Um, they're active in the communities. So I'm very proud of that. So provincially though, again, as I mentioned earlier, there, there is, there, there is definite data and feedback that says there's a gap. So a few ways that we're going to try to address that gap and they're coming up very, very soon. So one is we're going to host regional executive director led and in the CSAP would be the superintendent. And that's worth noting too. We still have one school board and that's our French school board, the Conseil Scolaire Acadien Provincial. So they'd be across the province. So we are going to host regional information sessions. So the piece around that that's new is we're going to focus on kind of three key areas. So student achievement, student well-being, and new is capital planning. So that will give communities, we're going to put out kind of information pieces, communiques that will invite families for us. We're doing it in our three counties. So Yarmouth, Digby, and Shelburne County. And we're going to host three of those per year, kind of fall, winter, spring. And we're going to invite communities in to, to be transparent, to be collaborative, collaborative, sorry, and, um, do some sessions with families around. This is what the system now looks like, um, sharing provincial assessment data, 
um, sharing. We do a student student uh, success survey, so talking about um, sense of belonging and safety and equity, um, and then open up the books on on capital planning. How do, how does the process work provincially and get some feedback? So that's that's one piece. Another big piece, which I'm I'm really looking forward to, is kind of two pronged. One of them is the regional advisory councils. So for those, we're putting out a call of interest to our families, and we're going to mainly go through SACs. This will be a table of 12 to 18 uh, community members that will work directly with, with the role I'm in, the regional executive director, and work in an advisory capacity around all things education. So that would mirror a lot of things that the school board would have done. It's a, it's a direct line into the region. It's, it's a direct line for us into the communities. So obviously, we want a wide array of, of representation for those families. And we're going to focus on those pillars. We want to talk about how are the kids doing? How do we know? We want to talk about safety, belonging, well-being, equity, all those pieces. And again, capital planning, how does funding work? Like those are pieces in the school board days where that, that information would have been out there and, and available. And we, we've since, based on feedback, have fallen away from that. So being transparent on financial processes, on what do what grants right. look like, those pieces. So, and, and then finally, we're going to do a student advisory council and, and that happens in systems and some of it already happens in Nova Scotia. It will be fairly new for Tri-County. So again, 12 to 18 students that uh, I'll meet with three times annually. And the goal there will be, I mean, first voice experience. How's it going? What's it like day to day as an elementary school student in Shelburne uh, versus what's it look like to be a secondary student at Islands Consolidated School? Um, where you literally need a ferry to to access. So I think those are three pillars where it creates stronger links from community to school and community to region. And I think the key deliverables and the guiding principles of the regional advisory table will will closely mirror the activities and the conversations of that of a school board. So I think those three in their there those are ministerial um, projects, and I really think those will land well in our communities. It sounds like you're certainly acknowledging where we have to get better and, and, and are being pretty proactive. At who, who is your boss? So I report directly to the deputy minister at the province. That's obviously a big change because, you know, school boards are definitely that's right. your boss. You have a different boss now. So that's, yeah, that's a different change. Well, let's, let's shift a little bit, talk more specifically about Tri-County. And I know you alluded to this, and I think when we had our prep call for this, you, you were gushing a little bit over the people that you work with as yeah. as being something you're proud of. And so you can share that a little, or maybe there's other things you think of when you think about what you're proud of in the Tri-County region. Well, that's, I could talk for days. Yeah, I, I think I'll start first and foremost. I mean, I'm extremely pl- proud of the regional team that we have here. Special people, people who have known each other a very long time. We're a very small region by number, very big region geographically, but a very tight knit uh, team. So yeah, I, I couldn't pick a better leadership team to have here. So active in the schools. I think sometimes you hear regional office, we don't see them in schools. That's certainly not the case here. We're, we're out in schools constantly and out in community a fair amount as well. So, but being born in Yarmouth, having close connections to both the, the Shelburne side and, and the Digby side, and then, and then here in Yarmouth, obviously. I just think it's a beautiful place to live. I think the towns and communities and villages and cultures and different groups that we have here are just, in my mind, a perfect makeup. But I admit I'm very biased when I say that. My kids are now in the system and I, I watch them come home every day. They're gushing about school, gushing about their friends. So we've been very fortunate that way. I, I think I'd go back to your earlier statement. It's relationships for us. We strive on relationships. I think we've built ourselves on relationships. I think we have such a diverse community um, across the Tri-Counties that I think having just that, that real historical knowledge and being ingrained, there's just something to be said for that. I won't lie, when it's cold out, I don't do it as much, but there's nothing better than walking home for lunch five minutes up the road and walking on Main Street and seeing everybody and seeing the high school kids and my colleagues from, from both Digby and Shelburne would express the same. So many of us are born and raised in those communities. It's funny, many of us went to the schools that, that we're currently coaching and uh, mentoring. So I just think it's a special place and I love the tight knit that it is. And I love the size. I, I used to think well, maybe we don't have as much and, and maybe our size is a disadvantage. And in the time in this position, I've completely done a 180. I think we're set up for success. 
as well or better than anybody because of our size and because of the just the closeness of our communities. This episode is brought to you by Advanced Learning Partnerships, also known as ALP. We are a professional learning consulting group that serves communities across North America. We are partners, designers, and agents for change. You can learn about more about the work we do at alplearn.com. And now back to the show. The pandemic had a pretty big influx of people coming to specifically Halifax. But what about your region? Did you get a lot, a lot of that spillover from uh, people wanting to find a new place to live? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, obviously you always think by ratio comparative Halifax being much bigger than us, but you know, per capita, we had a huge influx and in many different areas, you know, Digby, Digby's one that would stand out. A lot of newcomer families are in, are in the Digby area, Yarmouth, Shelburne, Barrington areas as well. So we certainly did see a big influx and, and the pandemic, as you said, you know, that, that changed the game for everybody. And, you know, for us, you live it in your own perspective and your perspective is your reality. You know, here in the Tri-County area, it was, it was hard for families and it was hard for local businesses. And, and we really did find out that, and it, it was a good thing out of a bad thing, but we found out just how much schools were the heartbeats of those communities. Mm-hmm. You know, breakfast programs, lunch programs, after school programs, the supports it where it was for families and the wraparound services that you'd have with partners in health and justice and those pieces. So yeah, the, the population growth impacted schools. We have more kids right now. You know, we haven't seen growth prior to the pandemic. So since the pandemic for our size per capita, we've had significant growth. So yeah, I think you're still feeling the after effects of, of COVID, but I think for us coming out of it was really just kind of sure it was just happiness because again, during the pandemic, it kind of reminded us that those schools are the heartbeats of the communities and, and families needed the schools. And, and we yeah. found out pretty quickly schools needed the families too. So it was, it was a, a very tough time, but something beautiful kind of came out of it. So no question, Jared, in the short time I've known you, you're a very positive person and you definitely see things with glass half full thing. But as a leader, you've had a pretty quick trajectory over the last few years in terms of your rise to the role you're in. But when you think back to all of that time, and then you can, you can pull from your time as principal or even in your current role, what is a leadership challenge that you've struggled with? Like it was a hard thing and part of the role that makes it maybe less appealing than, you know, all of the positive things that you just, you've just shared. So can you just maybe talk about a leadership challenge that you faced? Sure. To your earlier point, being the principal, well, I'll start off by saying being a student teacher then a teacher, then a vice principal and a principal at Yarmouth Central School, which is now a Yarmouth Elementary School, that, that formed who I am as a leader. I think too, you mentioned hockey earlier, right? Leadership. I certainly learned a lot in those hockey years too, you know, whether you're being a captain or that taught me a lot about relationships and leadership and and those kinds of things. But I was born and raised at, at Yarmouth Central School. Just taught me a lot. Like, you know, I, I grew up very fortunate, you know, two loving parents, you know, had, had every privilege that I could have asked for. So being so closely connected to the families at at Yarmouth Central School, you have all walks of life. You learn things about socioeconomics that you didn't know. You learn things about different marginalized communities. So, you know, working very closely with our African Nova Scotian families, our indigenous families, I learned so much and I think I continue to learn so much. So I think a leadership struggle that I've had it. I don't think I'd call it a struggle. I, I think it's just a part of being a lifelong learner. You, you learn things so much day to day, you know, just things like implicit bias, for example, understanding that, that you have things that you, that you didn't know you have. And without that lived experience, you know, it, it's a real challenge to, to be in the position that, that I'm in currently. And I'm very lucky to be in it, but still having days where you walk away from a conversation or you walk away from a professional development session and think, geez, I, I missed the boat on that one, or I didn't see that, or what I have a bias that I didn't know I had and trying to unpack that. But I think going back to the central school days, I had members of those communities that, that I could confide in, that I could talk to, that I could receive coaching and mentoring from, of helping me better understand how I can be an ally and, and how I can lead from the position I'm in. And that was always a question is, is how can I help? How can I be better at, at being a, an ally or an advocate? And it was always, you know, don't lead from the back, 
you're in the front, lead from the front and say the things that you're saying to me, to everybody. So I think for me, still getting my head around the inequities in our system, some of the systemic inequities that still exist and some of those systemic inequities that uh, I'm in every day. So again, like acknowledging my own privilege and being able to go in those communities and listen and to go to bed at night and still understand that there's racism in our schools still. There's, there's so many issues that our kids are facing that we're hearing them face. And, and while I'm proud of the work we've done and we have made gains, those gaps still exist and our kids are still experiencing racism and yeah. our, our gay community, our indigenous community, that there's still so many gaps there. So I think that's the part I struggle with Dean the most, I think is knowing I'm coming from a pl place of privilege and, and attentively listening and learning definitely listen more than talk and still trying to find ways to make those improvements. But I think, again, I think the hardest part for me is still understanding that I still have biases and I still have gaps in my own understanding. So it's certainly, I lean on the folks that can help me the most there in that area. When you think about your journey and you're trying to encourage, let's say, younger teachers to consider leadership. You need to keep a pipeline of good leaders coming through the Tri-County region. What advice would you give to a young person who says, that, hey, I'm, I, I, I'm thinking about becoming a principal or taking that leadership role. What should I do to get myself ready uh, to take on those kinds of roles? That's a great question. Well, number one, I'd encourage them to do it. You know, sometimes people joke and say, I wouldn't want my kids to be teachers or principals. I would love for my kids to be in the education system. I think it's, it's challenging, but it's rewarding. So number one, I would say, go for it. I think there's something to be said for being a part of a school and being a part of that school community for as long as you can. For me, again, it was, it was five, six years at Yarmouth, Yarmouth Central, where I got to really understand the community better. And, and the ir irony is I grew up 10 minutes from that community, but I, I would encourage new teachers to not be in a big rush. There's so much to learn in those classroom positions and connecting with kids and getting to know families. And I have some great friends in education, but one in particular, going to basketball games, going to their soccer games, going to their 4-H things and really ingraining yourself into the community. Be a part of an essay schools that have the home and school associations. That would be the advice I'd give because I think we work directly with kids and families, and those are the most important pieces of our system. And I think getting to know those families and understanding backgrounds and understanding really what does it mean to be a marginalized community? What does it mean to be someone who has, who has been subjected to racism? You know, being part of the LGBTQ plus community I think you have to have a good understanding of, of whether it's a region or a school or a school community, you have to have a good idea of, of the, the people that you're, that you're working with and the people that you're in care of. So that would be my big advice. I think sometimes, you know, things, you want things to happen quick in life, right? You want that and you want it now. I think in education, there's so much to learn and there's so much that you, you think one day and it changes the next. So I think, you know, spending spending five or six years out of school in a position and really opening up and being a part of that community really sets you up for when you become a principal. And I was fortunate enough that, that I did that path. I, I already had those relationships built and trust is everything. It doesn't come for free. So I think building that trust and, and, you know, leading by example, building that trust by your actions and your words. I think that's, that's something that if you're going to become a principal, that's the key piece is being a part of that community and building trust with that community. And, and again, there's still families from those Yarmouth central days that I keep in close touch with. I, I still work closely with, and they, I'm very quick to say they, they gave me more than I gave them. Wonderful. Well, continuing on that theme, I, I added this little section to my my episodes because I think it's the right thing to do. So I want to give you an opportunity to give a shout out to somebody. So somebody that you're grateful for, and this is where you have to name names. You can't just speak in oh, no. generality. You got to name a name. And I get it. People always say, well, there's so many people. I understand that. Totally get it. But today I want you to just think of one person. So there could be some recency bias. So maybe it was an admit assistant who brought you a coffee today or, or whatever it is. You can define that. But I'd also like it to be somebody who 
could listen to this and hear their name, hear their name being acknowledged as as somebody that you're grateful for. And I listen, we all know you got you you can't do them all, but today I'm forcing you to pick one. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Leadership yeah. challenge for you. Right here. That's a leadership challenge. Yeah. So I'm going to answer it. I definitely I have to answer this one. You know, it, it'd be it'd be pretty easy to say fam, my family and my wife and mother and father. It's funny you ask that. So I'm going to kind of do a curveball. I had a teacher, so I, I moved away from Yarmouth to play hockey. So I moved a couple hours up the road to, to Bridgewater. And I had a teacher there. And I mean, this is well before I got into education. His name was Mr. Lacane, Chuck Lacane. So I knew of him and played against his sons and sons were great hockey players. And, and lo and behold, he was a teacher. He taught history at Bridgewater High. And I loved everything about him. Took his class. It was an early morning class. He's from New York and kind of a stern military type guy, but he had a soft heart behind there. So lo and behold, there was a coaching change throughout the year and Mr. Lacane became my coach. And uh, so I fell in love with him as a teacher. Loved the way he ran his class, loved the way he connected, but he was a hockey coach that really challenged me and I had an immense respect for him, but I also kind of feared him if I'm being honest, like he was just that kind of guy and the type of guy I can remember one shift I had scored a goal and it was early in the shift. So I stayed on and played another few seconds or whatever and came off the bench and he yanked on my Jersey and asked me why I missed my assignment on the back check and didn't say anything. Well, that kind of describes who he was, but. He had a big impact on me. He just taught you things about respect and taught you things about being a leader and accountability, those kinds of things. And, and he told stories on the bus about his time. I'd get the number wrong, but public school. So PS 52 or whatever it was, but he'd tell stories about growing up there, how he became a teacher and the whole way through education. I've always, Mr. Lacane has always been in my head of whether it was a teacher or a leader. So he'd be the one I'd pick of. Just that person that, you know, he, he's that, when I think of, geez, who do I want to be like as a teacher? It was him. And uh, it's funny, there was a hockey school, Brian Graves is, a, and is an NHL player from, from our small town in Yarmouth, and he runs a hockey school every summer. So I, I was helping out and I was in the dressing room uh, this last summer. And it's funny how it works. Who walks in? Mr. Lacane. Uh, I hadn't seen him in, on, funny enough, about 25 years, probably. And, and I walked over to him and it was just, it was shook his hand and uh, it was great to see him. So that's a curveball that many people who yeah. listen to this, who know me wouldn't think Mr. Lacane, but it was, it was Mr. Lacane. Yeah. I think it's just so critical for us to, to name those names and, and yeah. keep those people in our hearts and minds. And I'm sure you could, you could give me a name of somebody who is maybe quite an opposite character of Chuck Lacane yeah. in terms of how they've helped you and they weren't in that kind of, that's part of this journey, right? Is you get to meet so many interesting people and take advantage of the people that aren't exactly like you. It's just the old adage that everybody's my teacher and that I can learn from them. And I don't think you get to where you are, Jared, without having a lot of really good people. Nobody does this journey by themselves. And the more, I think the best leaders I know are the ones who struggle with that question because they have so many people that they want to think of and thank. And so I uh, appreciate you just finding one. And I love that share. Yeah. So just as we wrap up here, Jared, you've been, you've been gracious with your time. I always kind of like to finish with these kind of these, these little uh, fun ones, if you will, just, uh, and I think I always find these ones people like, because they hear a recommendation they haven't heard before. So uh, currently, I don't know if you're a reader or a podcast listener, but give us, give us a, a book or two or whatever your, your, consuming more on a professional level like what are you learning about of late collective efficacy is is it's i've actually got a a sign up right above my my wall there so looking a lot at that it's really impacted our system we've done some book studies but it's it's kind of changed us where it's created i think a level of accountability that we've that we've never had but i will say like a specific recommendation is it was recommended to me by my predecessor dr chris bolter he bought the book for me. It's called Atomic Habits. It's a wonderful book just about leadership and, and clear. yeah, system-wide stuff. So yes, so that, that would be my recommendation if you want to, like if you're a system leader and you want to get kind of something a little outside the box, that's going to make a big in impact with your leaders. Uh, Atomic Habits is a great read. What about when you just want to get away and it's like, okay, enough of, enough of being this job. I just need, I need something, whether it's mindless or just 
non-educational and use I'm thinking now more in the viewing in the viewing vein. It could be something you read, but I'm thinking more about like binge watching that kind of thing. So it's funny. I'm not a big I'm not a big TV guy, but I will say so hockey. I, I gotta say coaching my daughter is the greatest thing in the world. Uh, I love it. She plays on a rep team with the boys and People would probably call me a, an offensive player, and she's just a stay-at-home, steady Eddie uh, de defensive player. But um, following our Yarmouth Mariners here in Yarmouth, I, I watch every home game uh, with my wife and two kids. Going to the rink, uh, being in the rink, being in the gym, and trying to stay in shape, but being around the players and bringing my kids around the players, those are things that, that I really value and treasure, I think. There's so many similarities between any kind of system and leadership to, to, to hockey. So I really enjoy, you know, volunteering with minor hockey and, uh, schools. And I just think it's, it's great. It's, it's a, it's a sport that gives so much and it's given me a ton. So anything I'm able to kind of give back with, with some of my friends is I really enjoy that. So that's probably the thing I do. And I guess it's, it's kind of an easy answer, but if I can watch a hockey game, that brings me quite a bit of peace, especially if I've got my kids sure. next to me. Yeah. You're at a stage in life where not only do you have a, a very demanding job that probably takes you away a, a, a lot, but also with young kids and, and your involvement. So that that's enough for you. Well, just as a side note, because I've, I've had this come up a couple of times and I wonder if it's different for you. So a uh, couple of superintendent CEO that have retired have talked about they're looking forward to not having as many, like having their evenings free. I wonder with you, uh, is have not having a board, does that give you a few more free evenings? Just as a random question. That's a good question. No. I think Because that could be the big selling point, I think, for a lot of these superintendents <laughs> whose <laughs> evenings are wrapped up with, with yeah. a lot of board meetings, but there's other things as well, but uh, board meetings that yeah. occupy your... I will tell you though, since the pandemic and you know, this virtual world, but I mean, all that comes along with accessibility too. You know, evenings, evenings are reasonable for me, I have to say. So I, I do come early, early in the morning. That's when I can get some bonus time done. It's kind of a, a non-negotiable for me. Unless I'm away, I'm eating supper with my wife and my kids and, and we have a billet. Will, who plays for the hockey team. So it's like the son in the house now. I eat supper with my family. I don't miss my daughter's practices. I, I'll take my daughter to dance along with my wife and, you know, she, she does sewing and things like that. They, there are some late nights, you know, when practice is over at eight 30, I'll come down and get some stuff done, but we're in time now. You can bring most things at home. Um, I try to go to SACs in person as much as I can, but when I can't, I can set up shop in, in our little office at home. I do feel, I, if you ask my wife, I don't know, it might be a different answer, but that the balance is, is, is okay. I'm just a big believer when you get into a leadership position, whether it's this or anything else, you do kind of sign up for over and above. That's just one of those things that, you know, it's not forced on you. It's, it's what you sign up for. And I think it teaches qualities in, in your kids. And I think commitment and accountability and responsibility are very big things that my family taught me. So yeah, it's busy, it's hard, but I, I'd be lying if I said I, I didn't love it. And, uh, part of it is loving the good, bad, and the ugly. And. You walk away with blood, sweat, and tears, but I, I got to say, I spend a lot of good time with my family and, and in the summers we have a, a piece of land and, and the best place in the world called Kemp and uh, we have our trailer out there. So I, I feel pretty healthy balance and I don't, my non-negotiable is my, my kids and my family will come first. Well, the other thing about that, Jared, is that you're modeling for your colleagues that in order for you to do well, you got to be well yourself. And so having a few of those things that say, no, no, this is. This is how I'm making, and again, the work-life balance is always a, yeah, it's a weird conversation because it, yeah. I don't know that it's always balanced, but you know what I mean? You do have to take care of yourself. And so if that means there, here's some things in my life that I just have to have in order for me to be well and do this job effectively, I think that sends a nice message to your colleagues. You, you mentioned your getaway. So my last question. So you live in a part of Nova Scotia that honestly, I've been to Nova Scotia a number of times. As I said, my son's family lived there and my daughter went to school at Dalhousie. So familiar with that part of it and even up towards Cape Breton, that part of it. But I've never been down as far south as you are. So give us the highlights of you're working for Tri-County Tourism now. What should I come and do in Tri-County for a couple of days? Well, as I'm speaking to you, I look to my left and I'm looking at the ocean. So we, it's. 
again, I, this is completely biased, but you should quote me on it. I think it's the, it's the greatest place on earth. If you, if you're in Digby, the waterfront in Digby, uh, the wharf in Digby is to die for. It's beautiful. Ferry is in Digby over to St. John's. They've got the Digby pines up there. So just a beautiful spot. Then you make your way down the French shore. So when I say the French shore, it's Arcadian shore. It's Clare, Matagan, and Sonierville. You are driving right along the ocean. You're driving along beaches, just little shops in, the, in that small town feel. And you make your way into Yarmouth and it's, it's bustling. It's, it, the main street is gorgeous. Our, our waterfronts, I'm looking at our Rudders Brew Pub restaurant right to the left of me, our, our family ferry terminal to the right, you know, and then you go up to Shelburne and there's such a historic waterfront in Shelburne. The Birchtown Black Loyalist Center is there and make your way up into communities like Lockport. So I think if you're coming, I'd take you on places. So there's a place called the Tuscan Islands that my father-in-law takes us to. It's an island in the middle of the ocean and so much history there with the fishing community and the Acadians. So you would need, if you're coming, I, I'd need you for about three days because we'd have to do Digby, Yarmouth and Shelburne. I can't just say Yarmouth. Okay. Um, but as a side note, my, my father and my mother's parents, so my uh, maternal grandparents, my other side is, is Cape Breton. So they always tease me. It's uh, both ends of the spectrum and they always joke around the Purdy, the Purdy name around these parts, but it's actually from Cape Breton. So. I get teased a lot that, you know, maybe the rowdier side is, is from the Cape Breton Island, not this one. <laughs> hey, Jared, thank you so much for your time. This is wonderful. And uh, I hope we can continue talking because there's a lot more I can learn from you for sure. And, and all the great work that's happening in Tri-County. So thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. I really appreciate you having me. 